I joined the Air Force in probably September, October 1947. It was going to be a hard winter, I probably didn't realise it then. I travelled to Bridge North, where I was going to do square bashing, eight weeks of it, by train. And along that route, the autumn leaves have been turning and the colourful vista was very good indeed. Uh, I was quite impressed with that particular train journey. The first problem I hit when joining the Air Force was my big frame and my big feet. Anyway, the Air Force finally found a suit to fit and shoes to fit. And so I started square, square bashing in Bridgenall. Uh, we were housed in Nissen huts, probably 20 people per hut. Each hut also had one corporal. The corporal was a um, drill instructor, and it was his job to train us to march, etc., and so forth and so on. He stayed with the group through the eight weeks. And so square bashing it was. Uh, but before all that happened, we had, we had all had jabs for whatever they jabbed you for in those days. And I fell ill resulting from these jabs, although I didn't know it at the time. And in fact, I was standing on the parade's ground in formation. Uh, the group uh, standing to attention, rifles to our sides, and I, I guess, fainted because I collapsed at attention and landed on my face. The first, the first next thing I knew was I was in bed in the hospital uh, with the doctor taking bits of grit out of my face. It's how I lost one of my front teeth. That was never replaced and it, in fact, uh, impacted upon me. I very seldom open my mouth when I smile, basically because there's a big gap there and one was forever trying to hide that. Anyway, that passed and I rejoined the group and went through the process of being drilled and learning left from right. That seemed to be going all right as far as I'm concerned. But in fact, as the course progressed, the particular your instructor in charge of us, I think, decided that because of my stature, I would make a good drill instructor myself. And he had me drilling the squad, left, right, left, right, turn left, turn right, and so on. I saw through that, no way was I going to be a drill instructor, so I quickly made a bit of a mess of that, and that was the last I'd heard of that. We shot on the range with 303 rifles. I always thought I was a fairly good shot, and didn't do too badly. The passing out parade came eight weeks later and the station commander had a little dios and we carried out the parade in front of him. I don't know, there must have been a couple of hundred, I guess, recruits there training. And he promptly told us that uh, he, he thought we were a shambles that we should be put back a week and do the last week again. That never happened, of course, because by then they probably had another 200 people coming in. They didn't have the room and the time to deal with that. Anyway, that was his comments. Can't say I agree with him. It seemed to me that we did pretty well. Anyway, subsequent to that, we were all interviewed with the aim of deciding into which branch of the Air Force we should go. Everybody was given two options of their own, and I chose, obviously, electrician. But like probably 90% of the other people, my second choice was ASC Rescue. Um, anyway, upon interview, the officer who took my interview and I, I'm not sure we got on very well. We certainly had cross messages in my answers 
to his questions on matters of electricity. Anyway, I think his final comment was, OK, I'm reluctant, but I'll pass you through to be trained as an aircraft electrician. And so it was. We were all, all posted to our various squadrons. I'm not quite sure where I ended up, actually. But uh, I ended, did end up in the electrical section of a squadron. And the sergeant in charge put me in charge of aircraft battery, recharge and maintenance. Uh, these batteries that were used in the aircraft were pretty big and pretty heavy. And I stuck that for two or three weeks. The weight and size wasn't a problem. Well, what was a problem for me was the smell of sulfuric acid that I thought was pretty awful. So I went to the sergeant and said, sorry, but I'm not terribly happy with this particular job. Uh, and he did find me something else to do, but I can't remember what. Subsequently, there was obviously a decision somewhere that, uh, that they wanted a group to carry out maintenance on air radar systems on Lancaster bombers. And that somebody obviously thought about where to get them, the, these people they wanted. The obvious choice would be the electrical group. And so that somebody chose, I don't know, 10, 12 names from the list and I happened to be in, one, in that list, in that choice. And so I found myself, in fact, posted to Yatesbury and Wilt, and the group I'm talking about came together there to be trained as air radar assistants. Normally the air radar grading in, in the Air Force was for technicians and fitters. The technicians course was probably six months or whatever. The fitters course was a year. The assistance course that was put together for us um, lasted about eight weeks. That group in that class in 1947 uh, remained together actually for the two years that we were all in the Air Force. We all uh, passed through the course of eight weeks and we were, as a group, posted to Lindholm near Doncaster to work with a squadron that was devoted to uh, crossover training from two engine aircraft to four engine aircraft, which of course was the Avro Lancaster, which was the mainstay bomber of the Air Force at that time. The routine on that Squadron was tra aircraft would tra take off on cross country missions, as they called them. These missions would normally take off around about um, eight o'clock or so in the evening and would return about two o'clock in the morning. The assistance air radar assistance job was really first line servicing, i.e., we went to the aircraft ran up the system, checked if it worked, if it didn't, changed boxes and got it to work. The boxes that were taken out as unserviceable were returned to the radar section and the technicians and the fitters repaired them. And so that sort of cycle went on. While whilst I was at Lindholm, I taught myself to drive. Uh, I certainly hadn't driven up, driven at all up to that time. But I talked, to, talked to myself to drive on a 1500 weight Gary, as they called them, Comma and Bedford and so on were the people that made these vehicles. In the back of each vehicle was a petrol electric generating set. In other words, it was petrol engine driving a generator and the, uh, the output of the generator would be put into the aircraft and we used that to run up the radar systems that we were interested in servicing. 
And as a consequence, I got a license to drive the Gary around stations. It wasn't a license to go out on the public road. It, was, it turned out to be useful, actually, because apart from everything else, the only time I got anywhere near having a charge against me and coming up in front of the station commander, I suppose, was when I left a Gary too close to the perimeter track on the airfield and um, a, a bomber landed and came around the parry track and there was the possibility that he would have hit the Gary with his wingtips. I looked out of the aircraft I was servicing at the time and saw this, this aircraft engine running, standing there with a pilot glaring out of his cockpit at me because I'd left my Gary in the way. So I rushed down and moved it, and he went off. And there was talk of a charge as a result of that. I, I uh, let it be known to the section com commander and flight lieutenant that if I was charged, and et cetera, then I wouldn't be driving anymore. That seemed to do the trick, and I heard nothing more about it. A little later, the, air, the runways at Lindholm started to break up and we were all moved to Scampton. 